Okay, hello and welcome to this lesson on how the Norman Conquest changed or did not change some aspects of everyday life for ordinary people. This lesson is going to be particularly useful for you if you're an AQA GCSE history student, as the lesson is kind of geared to the specification for AQA. But equally, it's going to be useful if you're LXL or OCR, or indeed if you're a key stage three student and you're looking at the impact of the Norman Conquest on everyday life. You're going to want to start this lesson by getting a pen and paper so you can write things down and by copying out this title and the following key words. If you want to pause here so that you can copy those down, please do so. And I'm now going to go through some of these definitions. So first we have got aristocracy. Aristocracy is a word that really means all of the social elites in a country, often associated with owning land. Uh, another term for it that you might hear sometimes is ruling class. So that's aristocracy. Then we've got the murderum fine. If you've studied law and order under the Normans before, their legal system, then you will have heard about the murderum fine. This was a famous collective punishment that would be applied if uh, the Normans ever found someone that had been killed. If a Norman lord especially got assassinated or killed, then the murder and fine would come into effect. And what that was, was a fine that was applied to everyone in the village where the or the town where the Norman had been killed. So it's a very brutal form of collective punishment, almost like if you're in school and uh, a student misbehaves and then a teacher punish the entire class at once. It's that idea of collective responsibility. Then we've got the Doomsday Book. You probably know what this is already, but just to remind you, this was a book that recorded all property ownership in the country for the purposes of tax. It was one of William's methods of control and of increasing the level of his finances in the country. And that was brought in in 1086. Then we got Trial by Jury. This was a new kind of trial that only the Norman aristocrats, remember that from our first keyword, could demand. And it was where the peers, the other people on the same social level as the accused, would decide their guilt or innocence. And that's the version of trial that we still use today. Then we got trial by combat. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, you will know what this is. It's a, a trial where victory or defeat in one-on-one -on -one combat is what decides guilt or innocence. Again, this was not available uh, to the average peasant under the Normans. It was something only available on request to the Norman aristocracy if they were accused of a crime. Then we've got the forest laws. These were famously hated laws which banned peasants from hunting in the forests. Now, you might think, what's the big deal about banning hunting? You might even think hunting is cruel. But at this time, it had a very different significance. Peasants, and if you've seen the lesson on the year in the life of a peasant, you'll know this, peasants were often up against the threat of starvation. If they had a poor harvest in the summer, they could very likely die during the winter, because in the winter they were reliant completely on the crops that they'd managed to gather in during the summer. So if there was a bad harvest, they were up against starvation. And one of their only alternatives to using the produce from their farms was hunting for game in the forests. Now, when William came over, he made all of the forests his personal property for his own private use. And so he banned peasants from hunting there. And as you can imagine, this was a really hated move because it cut off one of the last sort of lifelines for a peasant if they'd fallen on hard times. And then finally, we've got the word Earl. We will have encountered this word before. Again, it means the highest rank among the elites. So aristocracy would be a word for the elites as a whole. And then the Earl is like the highest of the high among those elites in the feudal system. So where are we going in today's lesson? What are our destination questions? Well, we're going to try and answer two. Number one, we're going to consider how far did the Normans affect everyday life as a whole? So you're going to see that in some areas of everyday life, there was huge change. And in other areas, there was relative continuity, which means when things stay the same. Our second destination question is a little bit more complex. And it's how were different social classes affected differently by the conquest? Now, what I mean by social class is what sort of level you are in the hierarchy of Norman England. For example, the aristocracy would be the highest class the peasants would be the lowest. And then among the peasants, you would have the free men who are slightly higher and the villains who are slightly lower. 
in the middle between the aristocrats and the peasants. You've got the knights, you've got the burgesses. So you've got this whole hierarchy of different social classes. And the Normans affected these classes in very, very different ways in terms of uh, their impact on everyday life. Now, slightly unusually uh, for one of these lessons, we're going to deal with destination question two first, in a way. We're going to start with this idea of different impacts on different people, because I think it's a really interesting way into the topic. So let's start out with a little challenge. I'm going to put some facts and ideas up on the slide behind me. And I would like you to think about how might these facts and ideas link to the Norman Conquest. So fact number one, this relates to modern day England. Around 0.3% of the population owns two thirds of all the land in England. Just think about that for a moment. 0.3% owns two thirds, around 66% of all the land in England. That makes us, that makes England, one of the most unequal countries of the entire world for land ownership. I think we're only beaten by Brazil. Fact number three, buying a house is famously really difficult in England and especially in London because of high prices. Even if you can buy a house, even if you manage it, you save up enough, you still actually technically don't own it. So a lot of people don't know this, but even when you've bought your house, you technically are still a tenant, which means you're still just sort of sitting in there uh, and temporarily owning it, but not really owning it. Technically, it still belongs to the monarch, to the king or queen. So have a little think. See if you can guess how that might link to the Norman Conquest. If you've done a lesson on the feudal system, then you're going to be in a good place to answer this question. OK, let's see. So this behind me was a headline from The Guardian in 2012. High house prices, inequality. I blame the Normans. And what this article explains is that a lot of the inequality in modern Britain in terms of land ownership and a lot of the difficulty in buying a house comes from the legacy of the Norman conquest. Let's break that down a little bit. So a lot of the British aristocracy, remember that's the social elites, can actually directly trace their roots back to the Norman conquerors. They've got a lineage going back to William and the lords that came over and won the Battle of Hastings and crushed all of the rebellions and took over. It is, in some sense, the same set of people. Of course, there are others now, but there is a real strong link back to the set of people that came over with the Norman Conquest. And so arguably, that means that England's elite has been relatively unaffected for 1000 years. Ever since 1066, when William defeated Godwinson, we've had the same rough set, at least, of aristocrats, of social elites. And you can see this with things like Norman surnames. So some classic Norman surnames of the people that came over for the original conquest are Darcy, Percy and Montgomery. And those surnames tend to still be overrepresented uh, among the wealthiest in Britain and in the attendance registers at our top universities like Oxford and Cambridge. So the families that came over with the Norman conquest are still, their descendants are still sitting right at the top of our hierarchy in today's Britain, right at the top of this very unequal hierarchy that we have in the country in the modern world. And you can trace this right, right back to the Norman conquest, a thousand years of this history. So we're going to get into some of the details now, but before we do, I would like you to pause the video here and copy out this table. As we go through the lesson, we're going to fill out each row of this table in terms of looking at a different type of change, how it affected the aristocracy, the social elites, and then how it affected the ordinary person, the peasantry. We're going to begin with the land. So pause the video here, copy it out for yourself, and when you are ready, we will move on. OK, so let's look at how the Normans changed land ownership. I'll just give you a few moments to read this and then we'll talk through it. So the really big change here is that under the Anglo-Saxons, land ownership was divided into a quite small number of vast earldoms. 
So there were earldoms like Mercia or Wessex, but there was only a handful of them and they covered the whole of England. So the earls were a really small number of incredibly powerful people that controlled vast swathes of land. William changes this. William makes it so that he is the sole technical owner of all of the land in the country. So remember what we said at the start of the lesson about how if you buy a house, you're technically still a tenant and the monarch is actually the legal owner of the land. Well, that stems right back to the Norman Conquest and the feudal system when William the Conqueror made himself the sole legal owner of every bit of land in the country. Now, that does not mean that William was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of each bit of land. He leased out that land to his barons, to his earls, to his tenants in chief. But he made a key difference with how the Anglo-Saxons had operated this system of land ownership. And that is that he broke up the land into much, much smaller pieces and he spread out those pieces of land amongst a higher number of aristocrats of social elites. And the reason he did this is because if you had a small number of earls with very large portions of England's land, then those earls were potentially a significant threat, even on their own, to William's power. And William is concerned here, first and foremost, with holding on to his own power. He just wants to do whatever he can at all costs to make sure that he stays on the throne. And so he parcels up all of that land. He hands it out in little bits so no one earl can become too powerful to be able to challenge him. So that's how it affected the aristocracy. What about the peasants? Just take a few moments to read this and then again we will go through it. So this one, pretty simple, the relationship of peasants to land ownership did not really change because they're just in the same situation of powerlessness that they have always been. Under the Anglo-Saxons, no power, no ownership of the land. Under the Normans, no power, no ownership of the land. The only thing that has really changed is the nationality of their masters. So that is a change, but it's a relatively superficial one. It's not like they actually got any genuine increase or decrease in power. They just stayed at the same uh, sort of low rung bottom level that they always had done. So you want to fill out your table now for the aristocracy and the peasantry on land ownership. And it's going to want to look something like this. So just a brief summary in each one. You don't want to put every bit of information. It's a really good skill to practice is summarizing and shortening down the information that you learn. I've put in bold here um, particularly key points that I think it is worth remembering. You don't want to copy my wording either. You want to put things into your own words where you can. If you need a bit of time here, pause the video to catch up and then we will look at the new laws. OK, so on to the new laws and uh, their changes to everyday life. So this is the one for the aristocracy. Let's take a few moments to read it together. OK, so first things first, William does not change the financial system. He's basically impressed with the way that England manages its money. So all he does is he adds an exchequer, which is where the king's money was kept, and a new minting system, which means the creation of new coins. However, what he does change, for the aristocracy at least, is the system of trials. So he introduces two new kinds of trial that you can request if you're a Norman aristocrat and you get accused of a crime. Those are trial by jury, where you're judged by your peers, the other people on your level, and trial by combat, where you can fight one-on-one -on -one with someone and victory or defeat in that battle will determine whether you're uh, guilty or innocent. However, this is only something that the aristocrats can access. It is not something that the peasants can get their hands on. Now we'll have a look at the peasantry. Again, just take a few moments to have a read and then we'll discuss this one. So as we've discussed just now, the peasants didn't have access to those new methods of trial. So that is unchanged. They are still stuck with the grisly trial by ordeal, including water and fire. Go away and research those if you don't know about them. They're beyond the scope of this lesson. Uh, but they are quite shocking and horrific and they're fun to look at. 
However, there were some other changes that did affect the peasants. And the two major ones are, number one, the forest laws, and number two, the merger and fine. So the forest laws and the merger and fine are both in our key words, but we'll just go back over them again now. The forest laws were where peasants were banned from hunting in the forests, and this caused a significant number of them to starve because hunting acted as a kind of last lifeline in the event of a poor harvest and the threat of starvation during the winter. The merger and fine is particularly brutal because if a Norman lord gets assassinated, and this wasn't unheard of, the Normans were hated by a significant section of the conquered English population for a long time, then the entire area would be punished with the merger and fine. Everyone would lose money. And so this was a sort of collective hated responsibility that was forced on them by the Normans, a big change to everyday life. So again, we're going to want to fill out our table and this time it will be for the new laws. So again, I've bolded what I think is particularly significant. Take a moment here to pause and get down the key points. How did the new laws affect the aristocracy and how did they affect the peasantry? Okay, we are now going to move on to castles. So take a moment to read how Norman castles affected the aristocracy. So castles sort of had an initial short term purpose that was different from what they ended up serving in the long term. In the short term, the castles were really an instrument of terror against the Anglo-Saxon population and a means of protection for the Norman lords. So the Normans have come over. They've won the Battle of Hastings, but William has got to make sure his grip on the throne is nice and secure. And to do that, he needed to do two things. One, he needed to make sure his Norman barons, his Norman earls, didn't get killed. They were big, big targets for assassination by the Anglo-Saxon English population because the English population hated the Normans at first. They had loved Harold Godwinson. They resented the idea of a foreign invader coming and taking over their country. And so reprisal attacks, revenge attacks against the Norman lords were common. And William needed to protect those lords by putting them inside the castles. The second reason in the short term that he built these castles was just to sort of terrorise and impress the local populations so that they would be dissuaded, unlikely, to rebel. It was a way of putting down any of those potential rebellions. However, once all that was done, and that's, that's sort of a big once, it took a while to quash all of these rebellions and for the Norman control to be solidified. But once that was done, the castles started to serve a second purpose where they became centres for trade and commerce. So they moved away from just their strictly military purpose towards being hubs of trade. So that was for the aristocracy, but what about the peasants? Again, as usual, just take a quick moment to read here and then we will discuss. So the impact of the castles on the peasants is sort of like um, twofold. It's, um, there are two different impacts. The first impact is negative. They were intimidated, as we, as we spoke about just now, by the construction of the castles. It was designed to do that. That was their job. However, on the other side of things, there were many local peasants that would work in the Bailey. I'm just going to go briefly onto the next slide to show you that. So you may have seen a Mott and Bailey castle before. The Bailey is this sort of area, this circular area here, where you can see the houses and the people inside. This is where people would live. And if you were a peasant living inside the Bailey, then you were protected from attack. So as well as it being intimidating, on the other more positive side of things, it could offer you some genuine protection. However, back over onto the negatives, it was the case that in a lot of situations, the peasants' land and houses were destroyed to make way for the construction of the castle. So that, again, was a negative. So lots of different kind of impacts for the peasants there, some positive and some negative. So we're now going to fill out our third row of the table, this time for castles. Again, pause if you need to. 
have a particular look at the sections that I've put in bold as they are the most vital information, the most key points that you definitely want to make sure you've got down and understood. And then we'll move on to language. OK, so the Norman Conquest final change on everyday life that we're going to look at was language. Take a little moment to read how language impacted the aristocracy and then we'll discuss. OK, so the aristocracy from Normandy bring over their language, which is obviously French, and they make that the official language of government in England. So that is quite a significant change. And they also make it the language of law. However, they don't make it the language of absolutely everything in the country. They notably leave religion to be conducted in Latin. They regarded that as the appropriate language for church services to be conducted in. And in the long run, you actually just get a merging of the Anglo-Saxon English language with the Norman language. They sort of fuse together and become uh, their own language in the long term. So short term, the aristocracy bring French over and they make it the official language of the country. Long term, the Anglo-Saxon language and the French language merge together, but they leave at all times the church language to be Latin. OK, have a look at the impact on the peasantry. This is an interesting one. Now, this might seem like there was either no change or it was a trivial change for the peasants because the peasants did not start speaking French for a long time. For quite a while, they just kept speaking English. That was what they were used to. And just a few Norman words came into the language, for example, veal, arrow, bow and so on. However, what you've got to remember is that for the peasants, they have experienced the official language of law and government going from one that they understand to one that is alien to them. So you've got to put yourself in their shoes in some ways and think about how frightening that could potentially be. Suddenly, all of the power structures in your, in your country, all of the elites and all of the official systems are being operated in a language that you do not understand. So it's as though you're being pushed right out to the edge of your own country, as though you are no longer anything to do with it in some senses. So it's quite an alienating experience for those peasants. So final row of your table now, this time on language. As usual, pause the video if you need to catch up and take particular note of those sections in bold. OK, we've come towards the end of the lesson now and we're going to do a final task, which if you're doing the AQA unit, this is done in the style of an exam question that you might conceivably get on a paper. So the question is, write an account, which means kind of tell the story of the ways in which everyday life changed in England under the Normans. Now, my top tips for this, number one, you're going to want to explain a variety of different changes. If you just talk about the changes to castles, for example, then you would get some marks in the exam, but you can't get top marks for it. You need to show an awareness of more than one kind of change. And then for the very highest band of marks, you also need to show an awareness that these changes affected you differently, depending on which social class you belong to. So the language changes for the aristocracy were very different from the way that the language changes impacted the peasantry. And it's the same for each of the changes that we looked at on your table. So if you want to get those very highest marks, this would be out of eight in an exam. So if you want to get the seven or the eight, then show an awareness of those different groups and how they experience things in a different way. There are some sentence starters for you in that yellow box that you may want to use. Have a go at this. You want to spend about 10 minutes and that will nicely cap off what you've learned in today's lesson. So just a reminder of where we've been today before we uh, bring things to an end. We've looked at two destination questions. Number one, we thought about how far the Normans affected everyday life as a whole. And we considered uh, lots of different changes, four different changes and how they impacted everyday life. Number two, we thought about how different social classes have been impacted differently. So we started out with that point about how even the modern day elites are in some senses descended from the Norman conquerors. 
and how each of the four changes that we looked at affected the aristocracy very differently from the ordinary people, from the peasants. So we'll bring things to an end there. Thank you for listening and good luck with the rest of your courses.